Thank you all for coming. Uh, today we're we'll going to be talking about Barcode Medication Administration, or BCMA, how it applies to and how it applies to the health system. Uh, for this presentation, I have nothing to disclose, so we'll talk about the technical de details of barcodes, so what goes into a barcode, how it's read, and then we'll talk about the application of it to a health system and how it applies to us at UVA and what our plans are for BCMA and barcoding in the future. So a quick introduction to barcodes. I'm sure you've all seen them. We see them in our daily lives, whether it be in the pharmacy or out in the store. So what is it? It's basically a, a readable medium. It's a compact way to contain information and display it or send it off to some sort of software, whether it be a database. So for us, it would be something like Epic or Pixis or Tavist. So it's a very convenient way to convey information to, across the medium. So what does it actually look like and what does it contain? So the barcode, the traditional barcode, is a series of white and black uh, bars and spaces of different widths. How it's read is we all see the scanner. It reflects that red light. It, the barcode is actually read by the black bars absorb the light and the white spaces reflect the light back. So from the duration of that reflected light, the barcode is able to transpose that into a series of characters, which is sent across to that software to cross-reference it to whatever database we have. So it's really those white spaces and the duration of those white spaces that's able, that transposes that, that code or that actual information to what we actually see. So say like in a store, um, you have a bag of Doritos or something. Within that information and that barcode, that information, that those white spaces will contain the product, the price, and that's sent across to the register. So briefly, going into the actual components of a barcode, so there are start and stop characters that, that tell us when the optical scanner should start reading and stop reading based off these quiet zones here. And then there's the interpretation line, which is what we physically see and what we can actually read. And that's only for some barcodes, but it serves as a convenience for us if say there's any issues with the barcode reader that can't read, that um, isn't able to read the actual code or the actual bars, we can just type in those characters and it'll send that information too. So going briefly into the types of different barcodes, these are just some of the more common ones. There's the one-dimensional GS1 data bar and two-dimensional. So going into the one-dimensional, these are our classic barcodes, which I'm sure you've commonly seen. They're used a lot in uh, transportation, shipping, packaging. So whether it be those products that we see in the retail setting or in the grocery store or the actual physical boxes of meds that we see in the pharmacy safe, like a, a 12-pack box of Zosin vials, you'll generally see this UPC type of barcode that would be uh, on the outer packaging. Uh, the things with these, they're, they're traditional, so they've been the standard for a while. The issue with it or the disadvantages of it is compared to our other barcodes, they take a little bit more space and can't contain as much information. So it's two real negatives about these barcodes, but they've been so traditionally used that we see them to this day. The next type is GS1 data bar. These take a little bit less space and can contain more information. I'm sure you all have seen these on some vials, these uh, stack type of barcodes. So it's basically a way of s saving space, but still having getting, being able to convey more information. The issue with this though is also it could be too big for say a vial or a unit dose pack. So the, the, um, st the move push or push towards is towards these two-dimensional barcodes. These are uh, much more different than what we see traditionally, but I'm sure we've all seen them in our lives, whether it be the data matrix or these QR codes. So they contain more information or uh, they can have a larger character capacity and they take up even less space. So these are ideal for like our t tiny vials, like say our Zofran or on Dancitron vials. Um, this is able to be able to be uh, attached to that vial and contain more information. So with this, instead of just that basic NDC information, you could also contain the lot number of the drug as well as the expiration date. So these, uh, there's a big push towards these two-dimensional barcodes. And I'm not sure if you could read it very well on your slides, but a big push towards these two-dimensional barcodes uh, is from vaccines. So way back in... Um, in the late 90s, I believe, the CDC required that all vaccines have transposed or documented um, the lot number and expiration date. So if there's any like adverse events that occur, they can track it back to see if it's from that batch of vaccines. So with this, people have just been handwriting the lot number and expiration date. 
But when these two-dimensional barcodes came out, they noticed that they could actually just put that information into the barcode. And from that, they saw an increased compliance in that documentation, as well as uh, more ac an improvement in the accuracy and completeness of the documentation. So in 2013, there was a Drug Supply Chain Security Act from the FDA, which mandated that all vaccines have that two-dimensional barcode to allow uh, increased compliance for that documentation. And eventually, there's been pushes, like I said, to have the two-dimensional barcode as the standard. It's not currently in place, but um, there's been a lot of discussion amongst the FDA as well as the ISMP. So that's really the technical details behind barcodes. Uh, now we'll go into the application, so barcode and medication administration and what it means for us in a hospital setting. So in 2004, the FDA required barcode labels on pretty much everything. So our prescription drugs, our biologics, as well as our over-the-counter drugs. Of those, from those barcodes, it's required that the minimum amount of information it should have is the NDC. What the NDC is, I'm sure you've all, you've all seen too, is that 10 to 11 digit number. Typically contains uh, the medication name, so the product, the dosage, and the drug manufacturer labeler. So at the bare minimum, all products are required to have that information. Also uh, on top of that, the push for having these barcodes on, on medications, uh, the FDA reports that a little over a million people annually are injured from medication errors, whether it be from um, the prescribing process, repackaging, dispensing, administering, and barcoding serves as a way to help prevent errors in all those different processes, which we'll get into as well. So the need for BCMA, um, really it's to prevent medication errors, because there's, and I'm sure you've all seen on a daily basis too, and within a hospital, there are many things that could lead to medication errors. It could be something as simple as drug name confusion. There are so many drugs that sound similar, and with our, with our eyes, everything, and in high stress situations, it's really, it can be really tough to differentiate between different products. So what barcoding allows is a different way to identify those me medications and differentiate them in a highly accurate and fast way. Uh, drug labeling, so if a label, is, a label is off, this serves as a way to help us identify that medication accurately. And error tracking, so the nice thing about barcode, med barcode and medications is that with the barcode and scanning it into, say, like an electronic medical record, we can track errors that occur based off what was actually dispensed from the pharmacy, what was actually administered to the patient, and each of those processes. So it serves as a kind of a, a documentation of the, of the process of a medication coming in to the pharmacy, going to the patient, and gives us that closed loop, which we can see here. Uh, we talk a lot about a closed medication loop in the hospital setting to make sure that we keep track of all the medications and drugs that we have, because we all know drugs are dangerous and could be dangerous if taken incorrectly or prescribed or administered incorrectly. So having this closed medication loop serves as a way to make sure that everything that comes in goes, goes to the right avenues and goes correctly to the right patient. So and we could go through this too, as we can see um, in our current workflow also, we can see how barcoding affects each of these processes. So when the medication comes in to the slab, for, for example, we use the barcoding to inventory it into the TALIS machine. Uh, when we dispense it, the pharmacist verifies it by the barcode by also cross-referencing it to the TALIS database. From the dispensing and checking process, that medication is validated and barcoded into the PIXIS machines for storage. So that's validating it and cross-referencing it to a PIXIS database. And then for the actual medication administration, that's validating it and cross-referencing it to the database with an EPIC. So we have all these checks and balances in place to make sure that it's the correct medication and it's going the correct route. And obviously, charting it onto the MAR or the, patient, the patient's medical record serves as a way for us to keep track of everything that happened and the processes of that medication from when it got into the pharmacy to when it comes out and gets to the patient. So barcoding allows us to close that loop entirely. So obviously, barcoding, as you can see, is, um, involves a lot of people, involves a lot of teams. So fortunately here at UVA, we already have it in place, but at a hospital that plans on implementing BCMA, it takes a lot of teams and a lot of manpower to actually have it in place, have it in place and start a BCMA program. So within pharmacy, the expectation for us is that 
all barcodes, all, all medications and all products that get into the pharmacy and dispensed have a barcode, whether it be unit, dose, unit doses that we do in the pharmacy or from, say, Safecore, uh, on-site packaging, and making sure that every part of that package has a barcode on it. So the inner package, the outer package, patient-specific doses, and making sure that it's within our, all our databases so it could actually be cross-referenced and checked and validated. And as also creating a method for barcode management across systems. So this would be like our blue bins in the pharmacy. For nursing, for them to start, for the starting of a BCMA program, it's required that they have a, obviously a change in their workflow because now they're going to have to start dispensing by checking the medication against Pixis machine and then checking the medication by cross-referencing it to Epic when it's actually dispensed. So these are all, these would all be new processes for their workflow that's required for us to actually have a successful uh, program. For IT, the requirement is that the necessary equipment is in place. So do we have enough barcode scanners? Do we have the machines that could actually make those flag or uh, custom labels to make sure that everything can be, uh, can be scanned in? And then hospital administration. Uh, typically, you'd want your administration to gather compliance data across the hospital to make sure that the place that uh, the system that we have in place is actually successful and being utilized. And you want to gather in this uh, compliance to barcode medication administration, which is something that they do here on a monthly basis. So one of the goals of BCMA, one of them is to guard against the five rights of medication uh, administration. These are things that may seem pretty common sense to us, but every nurse has taught this, whether it be in school or in orientation, to guard against medication errors by applying these five rights. And they are the right patient, the right drug, the right dose, the right route, and at the right time. And barcoding allows us to adhere to all of these, all these different uh, rights to make sure that all of these are met to avoid patient and medication error. Another goal of BCMA, obviously the whole reason we implement this as well as pretty much any new process or technology is to achieve increased medication safety. And there's been a lot of support for BCMA as well as evidence supporting the, that it does in fact uh, reduce medication error. Some organizations that have um, ru ruled or required BCMA to be in place is uh, the FDA. They support, like I said, that all, medication lab all medications have that barcode on the label. The ISMP, so the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, obviously they're related to safe medication practices, so they would support this as well. They actually released a, a primer in 2002, so about 15 years ago, on assessing bedside barcode readiness, so determining what's required for, actually, for a hospital to actually implement a BCMA system, as well as the costs associated and the challenges and barriers. So they actually have like a toolkit of how to actually roll this out. Uh, the HIMSS organization, so they focus on health IT and how it impacts us in terms of outcomes. They have several webinars and tools also supporting BCMA and how to roll a successful BCMA program out. And then AASHP, obviously, they have multiple statements on BCMA technology. They're kind of like our standard on hospital pharmacy. Actually, most recently, in, in December of this past year, they released um, the ASHP Foundation released a toolkit, like a pharmacist toolkit for implementing barcode medication administration as well. So as you can see, there's multiple resources that we have in order to launch a BCMA program as well as maintain it in the long term. As far as evidence goes for BCMA, um, there's a lot of evidence supporting it that's published that supports its impact on medication errors and its reduction. Um, we're just going to go through a few of them. One of them, this one was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This one is about the effect of barcode technology on the safety of administration. So what they sought in this trial was to see whether barcode verification technology can help prevent medication errors. What they did was, this was done in uh, Brigham, and Young, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. What they did was they released the barcoding along with EMAR program and studied it over a nine-month period. And in that nine-month period, they sought to look at the rates of errors in terms of order transcription and medication administration. And within that, they differentiated it into timing errors, which would be administering the dose outside of one hour, as well as non-timing errors. So this would be like errors in the administration or dispensing process. 
And what they found was, with, in terms of their non-timing errors, they saw nearly a 50% or 40% reduction in the errors from pre-implementation to post-implementation. So in that nine-month period, they saw a huge impact in terms of medication errors and uh, the correlation between the medication errors as well as BCMA. In terms of timing errors, there was a small reduction in that, and transcription errors were virtually eliminated. And this has a lot to do with charting the medication with the barcode against the MAR. So what they concluded was that there was an overall reduction in total errors and adverse drug events. The transcription errors, as we saw, virtually eliminated. And uh, this was just for a nine-month period. Obviously, over a longer period of time, say for a year or greater, you would see a larger impact. So you would see that, uh, that delta of errors of non-timing, of those non-timing errors go much, much further down. And more evidence for BCMA. Um, there was an article in 2007 in the American Journal of Health System Pharmacy. They also saw over a 50% reduction in medication administration errors. In the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Journal in 2010, uh, they looked at barcode scanning at, across four healthcare facilities. They saw substantial reductions in all types of errors, that being medication, dosing, timing, and patient errors. And then in 2015, most recently, there was an article posted in the Journal of Patient Safety, and they saw substantial decreases, so close to 95% reduction in dispensing errors as well as other errors across. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of robust data supporting having a BCMA system. On the flip side, there are potential complications from having a BCMA system, especially early on. Um, one thing, at least differentiating it from into system factors and human factors, some system factors we could see is the barcode is unreadable. I'm sure we've all seen that time when, say, a barcode has been like scratched off or it's been torn, so it's tough to read. This could potentially lead to a workaround, which would obviously not comply with our system. Uh, if a unit dose pro product doesn't contain a barcode, so that's something that we would need to implement in a pharmacy to make sure that everything does have a barcode on it. So that's added work and efforts on our end that requires extra resources. So this could be a potential workaround for a hospital that's just starting a BCMA system. And also there's a potential of the short, uh, shortage of staff and resources. This is mainly from like early on in the implementation process. You may see that you need more people to actually make sure that everything has a barcode to teach uh, our pharmacy staff and nurses to make sure that everything is compliant, is, um, all the right methods are complied for and taken care of. So early on you could see that staff and resources could be thin, but that's something that would even out over time. Going into human factors, some factors or complications we could see on a, on a personnel level would be uh, the medication or patient just isn't scanned at all. This is something we typically see in the ED if a medication needs to be administered quickly. The workaround is that the medication isn't scanned at all. And obviously in some cases that could be appropriate, but obviously not in all cases. So that is a potential workaround. Uh, overriding the barcode alert. So it, there isn't, is, there's no real hard stop into administering medication without a barcode compliance. They can still override that barcode alert and still just administer it straight to the patient. So that's another potential workaround. And documenting a medication administration before the nurse actually physically administers it, say there, there's not a computer or um, a computer on wheels around, so they'll just document it onto the MAR ahead of time and then dispense it later on or administer it later on. This is another potential problem because it could affect timing of the medication in the long run. So these are just some potential complications from BCMA, and these are all addressed in those different toolkits through ASHP as well as um, ISMP. So BCMA at UVA. So fortunately here at UVA, we are fully integrated with BCMA across the inpatient side. So all the medications that come into the, our inpatient pharmacy and are dispensed to our inpatient units are all barcoded. Um, we have a standard process for the acquirement and inventory as well as making sure everything is barcoded in that respect. So everything that comes into this lab that doesn't have a barcode is a sign of barcode. And if it's not taught into the correct databases, it's put into our blue bins and that process is in place too. And like I said, our barcode compliance data here is examined on a monthly basis. As for future state, um, there's something called Epic Dispense Prep. 
uh, this is something that affects the Ivy Room and is something in place at Emily Kirk right now. What the plan is with Epic Dispense Prep is that we're able to scan medications that are used, single dose medications in, an, in, a, in the IV room. We can scan what's actually administered to the patient and document what's remaining in the, in the vial. So what that waste is, with Epic Dispense Prep, with tracking that, we can actually start billing for it through CMS. So we are able to gain money and chart for additional information, which is always a plus. This is something that they do in Emily Couric, and it's the plan is to roll it out to the inpatient side also. And this is actually in, in relation to a, a mandation by CMS that this is technically supposed to roll out uh, January 1st of this year. So we're a little behind, but that is something that's planned to happen on the inpatient side. Uh, EMAR charting of IV infusions with interoperability. So with the IV interoperability, we'll be able to, in real time, track what's actually being administered to patients as it's being administered, so in, so in real time and while it's actually infusing. So that's another benefit of BCMA. As well as charting medications on the clinic setting. So in our outpatient clinics and on the outpatient side, they don't use barcoding right now, which is a big hassle because we're never really able to truly see what the patient is administering. Plus, we have no documentation that they get administered the medication, so we have no way of billing for that medication. So with EPIC Phase 2, this will actually be a requirement as well to make sure that the medications that we get in are actually charred against the, their patient record so that we could actually charge and prove that this medication was actually administered. So these are all potential plans that we will have in place in the coming year. So just to wrap it all up and sum it all up, um, ASHP released a good statement on BCMA, basically summarizing the benefits of it. Uh, what they said is the prudent use of barcode scanning and inventory management, dose prep and packaging, and dispensing of meds can enhance patient safety and the quality of care. And this is obviously proven by all the data and the evidence that we've seen, as well as continuing data we have, as well as, and our compliance data that we monitor on a monthly basis. So getting into assessment questions, um, I think you all have packs too. So going to the first question, which of the following elements is not currently acquired by the FDA to be contained in the medication barcode? So right now it's just the NDC that's required. And the NDC is that medication uh, name or product, the dosage and the manufacturer. So right now for medications, the expiration date is not required, but that's something that we hope to see in the future. And it's only required for vaccines, but not uh, actual medications or the remainder of our medications. So assessment question two, which of the following is a right of medication administration and is insured with barcoded medication administration? Yeah, obviously it's all the above. And assessment three, uh, which of the following is a human factors limitation of barcoded medication administration? Yep, so that's something that we can control, but we just have the choice to override it. The rest of them are really system factors. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you all for coming, and I'd be happy to address any questions.